It happened in Iceland on Friday, March 19, 2021, at 8.45 p.m., about 20 miles southwest of the capital. Molten rock suddenly burst through the surface from below. Bright lava fountains then lit up the night sky. A volcano in this valley finally woke up after almost 800 years of sleeping soundly. We divide volcanoes into three categories – active, dormant, or extinct. Around 1,900 of them around the globe are considered active. That means they've erupted in the recent past and will likely do it again in the possible near future. Dormant volcanoes haven't popped off for a long time, but they still may in the future. You could say they're sort of sleeping. As for extinct ones, those guys haven't done anything in more than a million years. The eruption in Iceland wasn't super explosive, and this all happened 6 miles from the nearest town. So everyone was perfectly safe. Many even came to see it up close. While other brave visitors tried to fry eggs and bacon on the lava. Just be careful not to burn your breakfast black. Lava can be over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It burns everything in its path. Yet it also produces some of the most fertile land for agriculture. This eruption gave a relatively small amount of lava at first. But it's been spreading across the valley in different directions, forming a sort of shield that's constantly growing. You can never really predict how fast a lava flow will be until you see it. It all depends on how thick it is and how steep the mountain slope. Lava can ooze slowly at about 20 feet a minute, a fraction of the average person's walking speed. Or it can flow as fast as 30 miles per hour, which even the fastest person on Earth can't outrun. But the lava isn't even the most dangerous thing about volcanoes. That would be the toxic gases spewing from the eruption and those spread faster and further than the lava flow. Luckily, in Iceland's case, the wind has been blowing these gases away from residential areas. Scientists weren't surprised this volcano erupted. They knew it was coming. Increasingly stronger earthquakes had been shaking this area for the past 15 months. There were 50,000 earthquakes within just the three weeks leading up to the eruption. That's 100 per hour. The volcano has been active since March, and geologists say this could last for weeks, months, years, or even decades of constant eruptions in the area. Mount Shasta is in the top 5 most dangerous volcanoes in the US, so geologists are keeping a close eye on it. The last eruption was in 1250. I wasn't around then, but this volcano erupts every 600 to 800 years. Which means, tick-tock, we're due any day now. About an hour from Portland, Oregon, there's an active volcano that last erupted in the 19th century. Next time it goes off, scientists think it'll produce larger amounts of ash and dust. This could cause an electrical blackout and make water unsafe to drink in the area. But the experts pay close attention to Mount Hood. They'll be able to give plenty of warning so people can react in time. Kilauea is one of the most active volcanoes in the world. It's been erupting almost constantly since 1983, making it also one of the longest eruptions known on Earth. It's the youngest land volcano in Hawaii. Volcanoes can take thousands of years to form, but others can pop up practically overnight. A volcano in Mexico just erupted in an open field in 1943 and started growing from there. Within a year, it was almost 1,500 feet tall. When the eruptions finally stopped nine years later, the mount had reached a height of over 9,200 feet. Mount Fuji is an iconic symbol of Japan. The last time it erupted was in 1707, and it sent a shower of burning rocks as far as 60 miles away. If a similar eruption happened today, Tokyo would be within that vicinity. Mount Fuji is right on the Ring of Fire, that horseshoe-shaped region in the Pacific Ocean full of active volcanoes and earthquakes. From one end to the other, it's almost 25,000 miles long. It could wrap all the way around the Earth's equator. In January 2020, tall volcano in the Philippines started spewing lava, sending huge plumes of ash half a mile up into the sky. 
the eruption even triggered a rare phenomenon, a dirty thunderstorm. That's when the smoke cloud above a volcano produces its own lightning. The chance of volcanic tsunamis was also high. Those are usually caused by tectonic movements that occur because of volcanic activity. Tall has erupted more than 30 times in the last 450 years. This volcano in Ecuador last erupted in 2016. Scientists think it might be showing some early warning signs of magma on the move. This is an active stratovolcano, a specific cone-shaped type with steep sides. They form from sticky lava that doesn't flow that easily. That lava goes around the vent, cooling and piling on itself to form these steep walls. These types are more likely to produce explosive eruptions like the ones we see in movies. Ruapehu is the oldest national park in New Zealand, a volcanic wonderland where you can closely see all those steaming craters, magnificent lakes, and unusual rock formations. It last erupted in 2007 and has had 10 eruptions since the mid-19th century. But eruptions, lava flows, and toxic gases aren't the only danger coming from volcanoes. There's also a thing called lahar, a kind of volcanic mud flow of debris. In between eruptions, snow melts and a lake forms in the caldera. If the last eruption brought mud, ash, and rocks in the lake, it becomes dangerously full. In that case, only a temporary dam holds it back. Indonesia has the biggest number of active volcanoes in the world, including one called Anak Krakatoa. It means child of Krakatoa, and its famous parent isn't far away. A huge tsunami in 2018 partially woke Junior, a scary thought since Senior had one of the most powerful eruptions ever seen on this planet in 1883. Krakatoa's boom was the loudest sound ever heard. People over 2,000 miles away could hear the explosion. The sound wave circled the globe seven times. And scientists say it's hard to predict this volcano's eruption patterns. Mount Yasur in Vanuatu is one of just a few volcanoes in the world where you can see a lava lake. Tourists even go there to peer over the edge and get a look at the burning, bubbling lake below. Well, except for when the volcanic activity goes to levels 3 and 4 out of 5, that means there are more intense earthquakes, volcanic tremors, or steam, gas, or ash ejections. Then this place is off-limits because… duh! This volcano in the DR Congo has the most active and largest lake volcano in the world. And all that lava is unusually fluid meaning it travels faster and further than the stuff coming out of most volcanoes. It's certainly not amongst the tallest ones, but Ethiopia's Erta Ali is unique in that it has a lava lake almost constantly, which is pretty rare. The locals call it a smoking mountain because its lava lake often causes eruptions. This volcano is near the Danakil Depression, one of the hottest places on our planet. Marupi has been erupting on a regular basis since the mid-16th century. This volcano helps scientists do crucial research on how eruptions work and how they can warn people in time. After it was dormant for a while, this volcano in central Mexico sprang back to life in 1994. Ever since then, it's been producing huge mud flows and strong explosions in unpredictable intervals. In the past, enormous eruptions coming from this giant buried entire cities in pyramids. Imagine staying in a hotel and waking up to the magnificent view of a massive volcano covered in glowing rivers of lava and clouds of ash. When it lets off heat, visitors to this area in Guatemala take a chance to roast some marshmallows there. One of the most active volcanoes on Earth is on a small island north of Sicily. Stromboli has regular explosions, together with glowing lava coming from vents inside the crater. Not too far away is Etna, Europe's most active volcano and one of the biggest continental ones in the world. By the way, Earth definitely isn't the only planet with volcanoes. The largest one in our solar system is on Mars. It would cover the entire state of Arizona, and it rises nearly three times higher than Mount Everest. Ooh, don't look down. 
Whoa! Earth's surface is shaking. Long cracks split the ground open. Lava rivers are rapidly flowing down the slopes. Deafening noise is filling the air. Rocks and other debris are flying high up. Clouds of volcanic gas and ash cover the sky. Now, this is not a plot of a blockbuster disaster movie. It's what happens when super volcanoes decide to erupt. But this is likely not the scenario that will take place when the world's largest volcano, Mauna Loa, decides to finish its long, long nap. In 2021, scientists were sure it would happen soon. But so far, nothing. The volcano's seismicity keeps increasing and then going back to normal. But you never know when this giant will finally come back to life. That's why experts have been monitoring geological activity on Hawaii's largest island for quite some time. The Big Island of Hawaii is made up of five volcanoes, including the most active on the planet, Kilauea, and the largest, Mauna Loa. This gigantic thing makes up almost half the landmass of the island. And what lava Kilauea emits in one day, Mauna Loa could spew out within 20 minutes. That's what it did in 1984. While Mauna Loa's smaller sibling has been throwing tantrums for a while, the giant has been slumbering ever since its last eruption. But very recently, the Hawaii Volcano Observatory has recorded more than 200 mini earthquakes below Mauna Loa. It likely means an increased flow of magma down there. Good morning! The volcano might be waking up, or not. If Mauna Loa did suddenly erupt, lava flows could reach the ocean and the most populated and touristy places, like Captain Cook, very, very quickly, in a matter of hours. In 1984, the last time the volcano erupted, lava got as far as the outskirts of Hilo on the other side of the island. That's where a campus of the University of Hawaii is found. Luckily, people had a few weeks' warning to get ready for the disaster. These days, locals have special go-bags ready with the most important stuff, including documents and money. Such precautions can come in handy in case of an emergency evacuation. Even though most Mauna Loa eruptions have so far only affected the summit area, several of them sent lava all the way down to the ocean. And you never know how powerful the next eruption will be. Now, what is the highest mountain on Earth? Mount Everest, you say? Well, it depends. From seafloor to the summit, Mauna Loa is a thousand feet taller than the famous Himalayan peak. The volcano is so big, it makes the Pacific plate it's sitting on literally slump under its weight. Scientists say that when this monster of a volcano erupts, the volume of lava coming out per unit will be life-threatening. Over its recorded history, Mauna Loa has been erupting regularly, almost every six years. And even though the last eruption of the volcano occurred about 40 years ago, scientists are certain it'll happen again. Now, remember the scene I showed you at the beginning? Well, you can relax. It's not likely to happen with Mauna Loa. The thing is, big island volcanoes, including Mauna Loa, aren't very volatile. That's because they're shield volcanoes. These volcanoes got such a name because they aren't really very high and resemble a warrior's shield placed flat on the ground. Shield volcanoes get formed by very fluid lava. It travels farther and forms much thinner flows than lava erupted from a stratovolcano, which is conically shaped and tall, like the infamous Krakatoa in Indonesia. So if, or should I say when, Mauna Loa erupts, there probably won't be ash clouds and tons of debris. The most dangerous thing will be lava. Since Mauna Loa is a shield volcano, its lava is extremely fluid and voluminous, which allows it to flow far and fast. Using theoretical vent maps, experts from the Hawaii Volcano Observatory have made charts of possible lava flows. They're kind of worried about earthquakes clustering at high rates. It likely means that lava is on the move under the surface. 500 to 600 earthquakes per day are a serious reason to be on high alert. On the other hand, it doesn't necessarily mean a disaster or inevitable eruption. Around a decade ago, several earthquakes that happened at the same time signaled that something was happening under Mauna Loa. But an eruption didn't occur. Instead, half the volcano shifted a bit to the south. This way, it probably gave more room to magma so that it had enough space to stay beneath the surface. 
Now, let's get back to the catastrophic eruption we saw at the beginning of the video. That's what often happens when a supervolcano erupts. Those are volcanoes that have at least once had an eruption with a volcanic explosivity index of 8, which is the largest recorded number on the index. Supervolcanoes are often extremely large, with no cone at all. That's because they're typically the remains of gigantic magma chambers that once flared up, leaving behind a caldera. They're usually found over hot spots. Supervolcanoes can produce super eruptions, and when they do, they blow more than 240 cubic miles of ash, molten rock, and hot gases up into the air. In other words, four super eruptions could fill the Grand Canyon to the brim. Supervolcanoes get formed when gigantic volumes of scorching hot magma are trying to escape from deep underground. This magma rises close to the surface but can't break through Earth's crust. That's why a huge pressurized pool of bubbling magma gathers at a depth of only several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more magma is trying to get to the surface until, bam, a super eruption occurs. The most recent super eruption happened in New Zealand. Well, when I say recent, I mean around 26,500 years ago. Nah, I wasn't around then. That's when a supervolcano beneath the surface of Lake Taubo spewed into the air more than 300 cubic miles of ash and pumice. Imagine 500,000 Great Pyramids of Giza flying up at the same time. That's how incredibly powerful that eruption was. But the most exciting and confusing thing about the eruption was that the Taubo volcano simply didn't go off like many others. At first, everything was going as usual. More than 200 square miles of magma had built up under the surface, and the pressure was getting higher and higher. But after the rock cracked and the first part of lava rushed out of the crater, something went wrong, and the supervolcano took a break. Only several months later, the disastrous eruption shook the ground, and thousands of tons of lava, rocks, and ash flew high into the atmosphere. But the age of supervolcanoes isn't over. The most infamous of them all is probably the one in Yellowstone National Park. This giant handles at least three mega-powerful eruptions, and who knows how many smaller ones. If this monster erupted anywhere as strongly as it did 2.1 million years ago, it would spit out more than 588 cubic miles of red-hot material. You can probably picture it more vividly if I tell you that this volume is comparable to 65 million capital rotundas in Washington, D.C. piled together. Wow. Anyway, scientists are sure that Yellowstone doesn't present any danger these days. For an eruption to happen, magma inside must be at least 50% molten. With the Yellowstone caldera, this number is just 5 to 15%. But of course, Yellowstone isn't the only supervolcano on our planet. There's also New Zealand's Tabo you already know about, Japan's Eri Cauldra, California's Long Valley, Indonesia's Toba, any of them can one day produce a super eruption. There are also several so-called supervolcanoes that haven't lived up to this name yet because they've never produced anything like a super eruption. For example, in 1883, Indonesian volcano Krakatoa went off. The power of the eruption tore the volcano's walls open, and cold seawater rushed into its molten insides. The difference in temperature made the volcano blow up with a deafening boom. It was clearly heard 2,000 miles away in Australia. It earned the blast the title of the loudest sound in history. But even though the consequences of this event were truly catastrophic, it still turned out not powerful enough to be called a super eruption. One of the few places you haven't traveled to yet is a volcano. It's an opening in the Earth's crust through which hot gases, molten rock, and other stuff get to the surface of the planet. But which one should you choose? There are different kinds of them. For example, shield volcanoes are built almost entirely of solidified lava flows, or lava domes formed by small masses of lava that are too thick to travel great distances. You can also pick a cinder cone. It's the simplest kind of volcano out there. It's built from blobs of almost solid lava that erupts from a single vent. This lava is ejected into the air with great force. Then it breaks into tiny fragments that become solid and fall back as cinders. With time, they form an oval or circular cone around the vent. 
Such cones rarely rise more than a thousand feet. But what if you choose something even more impressive? How about traveling down a stratovolcano? Huge, steep-sided, and powerful. Once you've made your choice, you also decide to opt for an active volcano that is erupting at this very moment. What you're observing now is called a glowing avalanche. The volcano has just erupted a huge portion of lava, which has created a pyroclastic flow. Its temperature can reach an insane 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. You see how this flow gets formed from rock fragments and surges down the flank of the volcano at a speed of several hundred miles per hour. Ash is raining down on Earth like grayish, powdery snow. Volcanic ash consists of tiny particles of pulverized rock, volcanic glass, and minerals. When the ash gets mixed with the water from mountain streams and rivers, raging mud flows appear. Despite how scary it all looks, you get closer. Good thing you're wearing a protective suit that can withstand any temperature. The nearer you get, the more fumaroles you spot. These are holes and cracks at the base of the volcano and in its slopes. They emit huge clouds of steam and volcanic gases, carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. Some of the cracks are so large, you can probably squeeze through and sneak a peek inside the volcano. But you have a different destination, the crater. On your way there, you spot a strange conical structure on the side of the volcano. It looks like a horn growing on the main cone. It must be a secondary cone, also known as a parasitic cone. Such cones form around secondary vents that reach the surface of large volcanoes. In this case, an eruption can occur not only through the main vent at the top of the volcano, but also through these additional vents. In any case, that's not where you're heading. Soon, you reach the crater. It's a massive circular basin. When you go to its edge and look inside, you see it's also very deep. The lava vent, which is where you need to go, is at the bottom of the crater. But even before jumping into the vent, you spot some strange tubes hiding under the lava flow. Those are lava tubes, natural passages through which fresh liquid lava travels beneath the surface of the lava flow. You decide to make a detour and follow one of the tunnels. It's the main lava tube. You also spot several smaller tubes. They supply lava to one or more lava flows. If the volcano wasn't erupting at the moment, the lava would drain down slope from this tube system. The passages would have lava marks on the walls, a flat floor, and lava stalactites hanging from the ceiling. But even now, there's some empty space above the flowing lava. That's because it has eroded downward, making the tube deeper. But right now, you need to get back. You take the next turn and get back to the crater. You wait till the volcano spews another portion of boiling lava and dive into the volcano's throat. It's the entrance of the volcano. Lava and volcanic ash get ejected from here. The volcano's throat is wide and you easily travel deeper down. The lava around you glows bright red and orange. That's because when it first bursts to the surface, its temperature can reach 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough to melt iron. You move down the volcano's main vent. It's a weak point in our planet's crust. There, scorching hot magma manages to escape from its chamber and reach the surface. While going deeper and deeper into the vent, you notice sills. Sometimes, lava intrudes between the crack in the crust, pools there, and crystallizes. This creates deposits of ash and solidified lava. That's what sills are. Pretty soon, you reach a magma chamber. It's a large pool of molten rock. The one you're in at the moment is quite shallow. That's because it's not the main one. After traveling several more miles down through the vent, you get to another huge magma chamber. It supplies the small one beneath the base of the volcano. The main magma chamber lies in Earth's crust, which stretches from 3 to 44 miles deep. The molten rock there remains under extreme pressure, and the temperatures inside are incredibly high. With time, the rock surrounding the magma chamber starts to break and fracture. This creates outlets for the magma. And since it's made of a much less dense material than the surrounding rock, the magma begins to seep through the cracks to the surface. From the main chamber, it rises to the upper one. Then it makes its way to the surface in a powerful eruption. You explore the magma chamber and then decide to go even deeper than that, to the place from where all that molten rock gets into the magma chamber. 
you're moving through the crust. The volcano is located on land. That's why your trip takes longer than it would if you were traveling through the oceanic crust. It's only three to six miles wide. But the continental crust is much thicker. It can be 28 miles thick in some places. As you're going through the crust, you can't but notice its light color. That's because it consists mostly of granite. If you were going through the oceanic crust, the material surrounding you would be dark or nearly black because it has a different composition. The deeper you go, the hotter it becomes. Sure, the temperature here isn't as high as in the magma chamber, but still, at the boundary with the mantle, your thermometer shows 750 degrees Fahrenheit. At a depth of about 20 miles, you reach the boundary between the crust and the Earth's upper mantle. There, the pressure reaches a mind-boggling 10,000 atmospheres. That's where magma comes from. You could finish your journey and get back to the surface, but your curiosity gets the better of you. You decide to go deeper, all the way to the center of the Earth. The next layer on your way is the mantle. It makes up two-thirds of the Earth's mass and 84% of our planet's volume. It's 1,800 miles thick. The rock closer to the inner part of the mantle is semi-solid, like caramel candy. The upper part of the mantle, as well as the crust, is broken into massive pieces. They look like a colossal jigsaw puzzle. Those are tectonic plates. They drift at a speed of one to two inches per year. You're moving through the upper mantle and feel the temperatures rising up to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Near the boundary with the core, the temperature is already as high as 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The pressure in the lower mantle reaches 240,000 atmospheres. You'd feel the same pressure if 3,300 elephants made a tower on your head. At a depth of about 1,800 miles, you see the boundary between the mantle and the outer core. The insides of the planet around you are heated up to 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Such temperature is high enough to keep the outer core liquid. The pressure there is almost 2 million atmospheres, but it's not enough to make the iron that the core is made of solid again. The outer core is 1,500 miles thick. It churns in massive turbulent currents and generates a magnetic field. In the outer core, Earth's magnetic field is 50 times more powerful than at the surface. You are now more than 3,000 miles underground, and you've reached the inner core. It's a solid metal sphere, around 1,500 miles across. The inner core is immensely dense and spins faster than the rest of the planet. The temperature there is as high as on the surface of the sun, 9,800 degrees Fahrenheit. And the pressure inside the inner core is 3 million times greater than on the surface. It took about 500 million years for the inner core to form, which means it's younger than some parts of the crust. Okay, watch your step now. Millions of gallons of hot magma are gathering in one flow and rising thousands of miles to the surface of our planet. A massive fracture in a tectonic plate shakes the ground and fills the air with a loud hum. Fire, gases, lava erupt from the dark, unexplored depths of Earth's crust. A planetary-scale catastrophe has just happened, and no one's noticed it. Now imagine you're having fun on a luxury yacht, somewhere in the southwestern Pacific Ocean, drinking cocktails and sunbathing. At this moment, one of the most powerful volcanic eruptions in the planet's history is happening right below you. But you don't feel anything. You don't even drop your glass. Yeah, you can hear a strange sound coming from the ocean depths. You see foaming water and pieces of pumice floating up to the surface. But it doesn't bother you much. So how did it happen that we missed such a powerful eruption in 2012? Why did scientists find out about it only a few years later? The answer is simple. Water. An eruption of an ordinary volcano is a huge disaster. There are incandescent liquid metals and molten rock containing almost the entire periodic table inside our planet. All of this soup is called magma, and it's constantly boiling inside the subsoil of our world. This hot substance is lighter than the surrounding crust, so it always rises. Fortunately, the planet's surface is strong enough and doesn't allow magma to splash out. But sometimes, this protection fails. The upper part of Earth is covered with connected parts, tectonic plates. These plates collide with each other and then move apart. Imagine a big moving mosaic puzzle where all its parts are tectonic plates. And when a small part of this puzzle gets separated from another, magma immediately comes up. 
These unstable fault sites with leaking magma are called volcanoes. And when they erupt, it gets hot. Lava flows out of the vent and burns all the vegetation around. This is accompanied by earthquakes and thick black smoke. If a volcano spits out magma too high, it falls back to the surface in the form of fire rain. But the worst thing here is ash. It's not that ash that's left in your grill after a good barbecue, no no. Volcanic ash consists of solid particles harmful to any organism. These particles are not burnt wood, but various chemical elements. Volcanic ash is sharp, dense, and tangible. It can block sunlight, cover and destroy all plants, settle in your lungs. If you get too close to an erupting volcano, well, you better have a fireproof suit, oxygen tanks, a gas mask, and an underground shelter. Then you might survive, but there's no guarantee. At the same time, if an eruption occurs underwater, you don't need to worry about it. Of course, if you're not a marine biologist studying coral reefs nearby, or if you don't travel past that area in a submarine. In that case, boy, you're in trouble. When an underwater volcano erupts, this shakes a colossal area, heats the water, destroys the seabed. But almost nothing happens at the surface. The enormous pressure of millions of gallons of water suppresses the destructive power of the volcano. Molten rocks shooting out of Earth's crust get pressed against the seabed. Yeah, a submarine swimming by would be thrown off course and might collide with solidified lava. Fortunately, no such cases have ever been recorded, but it can easily become a reality because underwater eruptions happen pretty often. More than 70% of all volcanic activity occurs underwater, and almost no one notices it. In most cases, these volcanoes immediately fall asleep after they erupt and never wake up again. But in 2012, something happened, and scientists couldn't ignore it. Big pieces of pumice the size of a van began floating up in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. These rocks covered about 154 square miles. There were thousands of them. They looked like a group of unknown floating mini-islands. Volcanic stones were scattered in the ocean over the area twice as large as New Zealand. Scientists determined the full scale of the disaster with the help of deep-sea sonar devices. They studied the seabed at a depth of 4,000 feet for a long time and found 14 craters from which magma had flowed during the eruption. The seabed was covered with frozen lava flows and tons of ash. The researchers found that more than a third of the erupted volcanic material surfaced and was scattered all over the place. The rest remained at the bottom. This wiped out all marine life in the area. It seemed that this eruption was one of the largest in the entire history of observations. But in 2019, researchers discovered something even more significant. That was an underwater volcano three times higher than the Eiffel Tower. According to scientists' calculations, it ejected between 30 and 1,000 times more molten rock than the previous volcano. This monster had been feeding from the world's deepest magma reservoir we know about. Seismic activity here was so devastating that it destroyed everything around. Fortunately, not for long. After any eruption, life reappears like a phoenix rises from the ashes. And it's not just a figure of speech. Volcanic ash and lava around the volcano contain many useful mineral elements. All of them nourish the soil and help microorganisms develop on land and in the water. For this reason, there's usually so much vegetation, flowers, and trees around volcanoes. And underwater volcanoes can eventually form islands. This is a long process that ends with the appearance of a massive piece of land above the water surface. To understand how this happens, you need to go back millions of years. So, let's go! See this underwater volcano? There are sea dinosaurs, giant sharks, and ancient fish swimming around. Now the seabed starts shaking. The volcano releases tons of magma and ash. The water pressure immediately pushes all this stuff back to the bottom. The eruption can continue for a long time. The released magma raises the seabed. After hundreds, maybe a thousand years, a new eruption begins. New magma flows create a new layer above the previous one. Over millions of years, layer by layer, the volcano is growing. It's slowly rising, thanks to constant eruptions. Of course, with time, some volcanoes go dormant. But this one continues to erupt. And then, one day, the volcanic rock reaches the surface and an island emerges. After many more years, the volcano can fall asleep. After this, life is likely to appear on the island. 
grass, flowers, trees, animals. The area that was once ruined seabed is swarming with life now. Volcanic islands have unique ecosystems because they develop separately from all the continents. Observing such islands helps scientists understand how life on Earth evolves. New species of birds, animals, insects can live on these chunks of land. Hundreds of islands around the world appeared thanks to eruptions of underwater volcanoes. You can find them in Hawaii, Indonesia, Iceland. Many of them are inhabited by people who build villages and towns there. There were cases when a volcano erupted when people literally lived on top of it. That's what happened on the small island of Aogashima, located to the south of Tokyo. People built a beautiful town right in the crater of an active volcano. And in May 1785, an eruption began. Nobody expected this to happen. At some point, thousands of birds rose in the air and flew away from the island. Then the ground began to shake. A heavy, low sound shook the air. Thick smoke appeared above the top of the green volcano. The crater started spitting dirt, huge rocks, and red-hot pieces of magma into the sky. The disaster lasted several weeks. People somehow managed to evacuate. Then, finally, the volcano calmed down. After that, a long process of recovery started. The inhabitants of the town rebuilt houses, roads, infrastructure. More than 200 years have passed since that moment. And during this time, the volcano never woke up. And despite the risk of a new eruption, people continue living there. The population is growing. Many people from other cities and countries come to live there. The main reason everyone loves this place is that it looks like a paradise. Nobody wants to leave the island. There are thermal springs where you can bathe, dense jungle with many beautiful animals and trees. The soil is rich, and you can grow tasty fruit and vegetables there. The water near the coast is swarming with fish. Every day, you can enjoy the incredible landscapes of the island. Seismological services constantly monitor the situation and watch the volcano's activity, listening for a rumble that may someday come again. The snow-capped shape of Mount Taranaki in the middle of Egmont National Park in New Zealand is surrounded by a dense, dark-colored forest. It creates a gloomy green circle around the area. From above, the circle looks almost perfect. But it's only because of the local farmers. They use all the fertile soil they can, and it results in a contrasting color scheme. A near-perfect cone volcano, a rare geological phenomenon, has occasionally been erupting for over 100,000 years. It grew taller and larger after every eruption. It's predicted that in about 50 years, this volcano could turn the area around it into another Pompeii. In Italy, there's a unique spot known as the Giant Pink Bunny. You can find this humongous art project on the green fields of the Coletto Fava Mountain in northern Italy. The 200-foot-long and 20-foot-high bunny appeared in 2005. It was created by the art group Gelatin from Vienna. Not only does it have a strange and unique design, but it's also knitted. It took the team five years to finish the delicate structure. It used to be just like any other stuffed toy. Visitors could climb the bunny, taking in the views around them. But since it was placed on the hills, the art piece has started decaying. After all, it was only meant to last 20 years at the most. The once bright pink bunny has turned gray and has almost disappeared. If you look at the Google Maps satellite images these days, you might only notice its outline. While not as popular as Old Faithful, the Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone Park, Wyoming is one of the most spectacular sights to see even from ground level. But from above, the bright bands of orange, yellow, and green really start showing their beauty. It's one of the biggest springs in the world, larger than a football field at 370 feet across. The hot water in it travels 121 feet to the surface. The spring is a feeding ground for heat-loving bacteria that change their color in the cooler water. A director searching for an unusual area for filming discovered a mysterious floating island in northeastern Argentina. Almost perfectly round and surrounded by a dark forest, it gives you an eerie feeling. No wonder the place got nicknamed The Eye. With the help of time lapses on Google Earth, 
it was discovered that the inner landmass was moving around rather than sitting still as was first believed. A circle of land 387 feet in diameter, ranging from several inches to many feet in thickness, casually floats in the clear waters. It even rotates slowly, pushed by the cold water from below. This water is still being studied. It's completely exclusive to the surrounding area. From above, it looks like nothing more than a little island sitting in Homebush Bay, Australia. But zooming in will change that perspective. Once a successful trading port, the bay is filled with four abandoned cargo freighters that were too hard to remove. Once they became decommissioned, they were left in the bay and forgotten. The shipwreck SS Airfield transformed from a broken-down wreck into a small but beautiful nature reserve. It's filled with thriving mango trees that have overtaken the ship and are slowly breaking down its hull. In the Gobi Desert, in the northeast part of China, bizarre symbols appeared in certain areas. This led to many theories of what they could be. Maybe ancient markings like the Nazca lines found in Peru. Guesses range from odd weather patterns and pipelines for some future development to target practice areas. But it turned out to be none of those. They're simply special symbols used to calibrate the cameras on China's satellites. The Badlands Guardian in Walsh, Canada is one of the most famous and fascinating spots you can find on Google Earth. It looks like a man's head carved into the landscape. A feather headpiece that Native Americans used to wear sits on top of the head. It must be quite a modern design because the face also seems to have a pair of earphones. Unfortunately, it's just a simple road with an oil rig at the end. From ground level, the entire thing is not nearly as impressive. It looks just like any other exposed rock face that's been changed by the seasons. But this phenomenon is nothing more than the pareidolia effect the same that makes you see objects in the clouds. An island on a lake on an island in a lake on an island is surely a mouthful. But Google Earth beautifully captured the place. A tiny island named Vulcan Point sits inside a crater lake on an island called Volcano Island inside a lake called Lake Tull on the Philippine islands of Luzon. It's one of the only two lakes in the world that have been discovered to have a third-order island in them tall volcano is still active. And because of the large lake inside the crater, there's a risk of a volcanic tsunami. It can be triggered by debris falling into the lake after an eruption. This might create waves in the lake that can spill over the sides of the crater. The Firefox crop circle appeared in a cornfield in Oregon in 2006. But it wasn't some mystery or rare phenomenon. Celebrating the browser's 50 millionth download, the Linux users group from the Oregon State University created the giant logo. It was larger than 45,000 square feet. The group members stomped down all the stocks in a near-perfect circle. It was completed in under 24 hours after two careful weeks of planning. The final circle had a diameter of over 200 feet and was completely invisible from the road. It could only be appreciated from the sky. The most beautiful bright blue ponds are found at the intrepid potash mine near Moab, Utah. Most potash forms in desert regions, where inland seas or lakes dry out. As the water evaporates, it leaves behind potassium salt deposits. Most evaporation ponds are more reddish in color, but some dye was added to these particular ones. Dark water absorbs more sunlight and heat, speeding up the evaporation process. This leaves behind the salts much more quickly. Stunning aerial views of these ponds are a bonus. Making the largest advertising logo on Earth is something every marketing agency would dream of doing. And Coca-Cola did just that in 1986. The logo is an extremely large sculpture. It can only be viewed in its entirety from the sky. The biggest problem about such advertising, though, is that barely anyone knows about it. This huge Coke ad is 160 feet tall and 394 feet wide. It was built from 70,000 empty Coke bottles in northern Chile's Arica. The gigantic monument was created to celebrate the brand's 100-year anniversary.
A guitar of this size can only be appreciated from extremely high above. The unusual shaped forest is located south of Cordoba in the Pampa region of Argentina. Known as the Guitar Forest, it extends for more than half a mile. It also contains more than 7,000 cypress and eucalyptus trees. A 74-year-old Argentine farmer, with the help of his children, managed to transform this piece of land into something magical. All done to pay tribute to his beloved wife. From high above, this area seems to be just a collection of boulders in the middle of a lake. But this is actually Hippo Pool in Tanzania. Hippos are common in all the rivers in the area. But this spot is certainly the best in the Serengeti to watch them playing around. The animals there swim in large groups of about 200 hippos. They stir up the waters and fill every square inch of space inside. If you can't get to Tanzania to see the spectacle, Google Earth gives you the opportunity to have this experience in the safety of your home. There are many large-sized pools in the world. And then there's the pool at San Alfonso del Mar, a resort outside of Santiago, Chile. Officially, the world's largest pool ever created. It cost nearly $2 billion to build. The pool is roughly the size of about 16 football fields. The water for the pool is taken from the Pacific Ocean. It gets filtered and treated multiple times a day to keep the gigantic pool clean. There's a saltwater pool inside a large glass pyramid, if you want to swim in a pool inside a pool. I'm getting confused. A strange and mysterious swirling pattern appeared in the desert of Egypt back in 1997. When this design was first discovered on Google Earth, it created a bit of a stir of what it could be. That was until it turned out to be nothing more than a giant art installation called Desert Breath. Two intertwining spirals are complete opposites. One spiral is piles of sand that are shaped like cones. And the other is made of mini craters. When the installation was first completed, the spirals led to the center of a circular pool of water. But since then, the water has dried out.